One of the rocks most familiar to people living in southern Ontario is the rock of the Niagara Escarpment. And that rock originated in a warm subtropical sea about 400 million years ago. And it brings us back to a program on rocks, to the second of three, to the program on sedimentary rocks. However much the big ideas of geology are exciting, it remains that the best geologist, all things being equal, is the geologist who's seen the most rocks. And it's for this reason that we're getting back to the units on rocks. The rock kit should be back in your hands, and you should be looking at the sedimentary rocks and learning to identify them. And if you find them more interesting than the igneous rocks, then you can begin to call yourself a soft rock geologist. There are two classifications of geologists, soft and hard. Those who like sedimentary rocks are the soft rock geologists. Those who like the igneous rocks are the hard rock geologists. And so for a full hour on soft rocks. Sedimentary rocks, the second great family of rocks that we've looked at. They form about three quarters of the land surface of the Earth and are obviously very important. They have one thing in common. They result from the breakdown of earlier rocks. For example, this conglomerate is formed from pebbles broken down from earlier rock. This sandstone is formed of sand that resulted from the breakdown of earlier rock. So did this limestone, although in this case the limestone was formed from rock which had dissolved in water, and that dissolved material was precipitated by organisms, and you can see on this cut face the fragments of those organisms. Some sedimentary rocks show very obvious signs of the conditions under which they accumulated. These cracks are desiccation cracks produced when the mud of the sedimentary rock dried out when it was exposed to the air. These ripple marks bear evidence of very shallow water in which this sedimentary rock was deposited. The sandstone. So sedimentary rocks are important to us because they can tell us something about the conditions on the surface of the earth under which they accumulated. They can tell us something about the depth of water in which they accumulated, and therefore something about the depths of lakes and seas. Sometimes they can tell us about the temperature of that water. Sometimes they can tell us something about the direction of the wind and the climate and so forth. So it's very important that we be able to read the details of the accumulation, the details of the sedimentary rocks. Let's have a look at an example in an area that you're already, already familiar with. Many of these sandstone beds in the Grand Canyon are composed of sloping layers piled one on top of another. When examined closely, these layers can be seen to consist of smoothly rounded sand grains, all cemented tightly together to form the sandstone. As well as the sand grains and the composition of the rock, there are also traces of footprints on the surface of the sloping layers. Now, what does this kind of thing tell us about the origin of the rock? Digging a hole in a, a sand dune will help us answer that question. The sand dune also consists of sloping layers. 
in this case of sand, not cemented together, but quite round, just like in the sandstone. And on the surface of the dune, footprints. So the kinds of things that we can observe in sedimentary rocks, which tell us something about the origin of the rock, the conditions under which it accumulated, are the structures in the rock, such as the cross bedding and the sandstone you've just seen, and the desiccation cracks and the ripple marks and the specimens that I showed you a moment ago. We can also look at the grains, at their roundness. Those grains in the sandstone and the Grand Canyon were round because they'd been blown around by wind and had banged against one another. We can also look at the composition of the grains. They were nearly all quartz in the last example because the banging together had broken up the feldspars, which might originally have been there, the cleavage planes in the feldspars having allowed those grains to break. We can also look at the sorting of the grains, that is, the variation in size. In the last sandstone, they were very well sorted because wind tends to blow away all the finer material. But in order to understand those observations that we can make, we must understand something about the characteristics of the environment, an environment that's quite familiar to you, but about which you perhaps don't know too much, is a, a beach. There are many unsuspected characteristics. Let's have a, a look at the characteristics of and the environment of a beach. The waves that strike a beach usually strike it at an angle because they're generated in the open sea by storms. And the fact that they strike the beach at an angle controls the uh, environment of the sand grains. That is, it controls what happens to the sand grains. And we can show this by putting some markers into the surf zone. The markers don't travel backwards and forwards with the waves, but in fact move along the coast. And the same thing must be happening to the sand grains. They're going in toward the beach and back out again, but also along the beach. We call this current the longshore current. And it's what's responsible for piling up sand on the insides of groins. A model shows how the beach is like a river of sand moving down the coast. Each sand grain moving in a series of rough arcs. And when it reaches a, a groin, such as in this model, it moves around into the protective water of the, the bay, and there it settles. There are beaches along most of the coasts of North America, fed by rivers, but the sand just doesn't end at the beaches. It's carried down what we call submarine canyons on the edge of the continental shelf. It's easy to see why the beach comes to an end at the head of a submarine canyon. The sand is, in fact, drained off down the canyon, which might be as much as 20 miles long and extend to a depth of perhaps 3,000 feet. About 2,000 cubic yards of sand per year goes down some of the canyons of California. The process can be illustrated in this flume tank. The topography of the deep sea floor has been exaggerated in order to, to show the process more clearly. And the sand that moves down the canyon is represented by this material in a glass tank. Each time a flow takes place, it moves down the canyon over the sea floor as a kind of a turbid, muddy cloud. And the sand and mud settles out, particularly in the low places between the high points on the sea floor. Successive flows build up a series of layers. You can think of each flow perhaps be having been triggered off by an earthquake. The sand poured into the canyon from the beach having lain at